Thank you. Um, I call to order this meeting of the Oversight Committee, and it is 0900 hours on 9 a.m. Um, Ms. Payne, please proceed with the roll call. Dr. Cummings? Here. Mr. Margo? Here. Dr. Hernandez? Here. Mr. Montgomery? Here. Dr. Patel? Here. Dr. Rice? Here. Dr. Rosenfeld? Here. We have a quorum. That was nice and loud, but that's perfectly fine. <laughs> Members, you have the draft minutes from the August 17th and September 14th Oversight Committee meetings in your agenda packet behind tab one. Are there any corrections to the minutes as circulated? Hearing none, the Chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the August 17th and September 14th Oversight Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Our next agenda item is public comment. Texans created secret. Opening our meetings with public comment underscores this board's commitment to transparency and accountability. Ms. Royal, has secret received any requests to provide public comments? No, sir. Thank you. Members, we are fortunate today to have updates on two secret funded projects. First, you will hear an update on secret funded prevention project. Ms. Rajid will introduce you to Dr. Shea and Dr. Grimes. Good morning, members. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Aubrey Shea. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at UT Health Houston School of Public Health in San Antonio. Dr. Shea is a behavioral scientist whose research is focused on patient provider communication and decision making in the context of cancer prevention and control with particular focus on um, survivorship among adolescents and young adults. Her background as a pediatric hematology and oncology social worker provided her with hands-on experience supporting, advocating for um, cancer patients and their caregivers. Because of this experience, her research focuses on how to actively engage cancer patients and caregivers to enable them to make informed, value-concordant decisions about their cancer prevention and care with the goal of pr improving outcomes. Dr. Shea has a master's in social work from the University of Texas at Austin and a PhD from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Dr. Allison Grimes is the co um, project director of this project. Unfortunately, she's unable to join us. She's taking care of her patients in clinic today. So um, I know you can relate, Dr. Patel. <laughs> um, Dr. Grimes is a pediatric oncologist and assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at University of Texas Health San Antonio and member of the Mays Cancer Center. Dr. Grimes' research is focused on supportive care and cancer care delivery in childhood and adolescent and young adult cancer. Dr. Grimes is the inaugural director of the AYA cancer program at a minority-based safety net hospital, University Health System in San Antonio. She is involved in clinical trial development and trial conduct in cancer care delivery, cancer control and prevention, and supportive care research across the state of Texas and nationally. Dr. Grimes received her undergraduate degree at Baylor University and her medical degree at UT Health San Antonio, where she completed her pediatric residency and hematology oncology fellowship training, and where she now serves as faculty. Um, and I'd now like to turn over the mic to Dr. Shea. Their presentation can be found behind tab two of your meeting pad. Hi, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you today. We're really excited to talk to you about our research, our, our pro prevention program and the work that it's done. 
Um, I, as um, Ramona said, I'm Dr. Shea. I'm, I'm Aubrey Shea, and I'm from UT Health Houston School of Public Health. Dr. Grimes really wanted to be here. She um, is the attending physician in her cl pediatric oncology clinic this week, so she's doing that important work that makes this all um, possible. But um, one of the things that I want to just highlight quickly before I get to the project is that CEPRA allowed us across two institutions to really make really strong collaborations, and we have continued to do that. And we'll talk about the end that we've had some national attention for this, and we hope to expand this pro program nationally. But the CEPRA funding allow us to um, start those formal collaborations. Um, I'm, I know you guys know about HPV-related cancers, so I'm not going to spend much time on the background, but I just wanted to say a couple things. I really like the CDC graphic that shows um, the idea of an iceberg, and the idea is that above the water is the things we all know about and we see easily, right? And so we know HPV, we've known for a while HPV um, infections are related to cervical cancers and cervical precancers. And again, with that above the water theme, these are the things we have clinical tests for so we can um, screen for these things. Below the water, though, um, not everyone is realizing as um, aware of how many cancers are related to HPV how many other cancers are related to HPV infections, most notably oral, oral pharyngeal cancers, which are now um, greater per year, greater number of diagnoses per year even than um, cervical cancer. And they, um, I think it's notable that that's even more common among males than females. So we're seeing that HPV vaccines are really important to everyone. And in total, um, over 34,000, almost 35,000 HPV-related cancers are diagnosed in the U.S. each year. And over 90% of these are preventable with the HPV vaccine. Um, also, in case anyone ever thought that um, HPV is just is rare or is just f among those who have you know very risky sexual behaviors or something, that's not true. HPV is really common. Um, it infects uh, um, H over 85% of people will have an HPV infection in their lifetime. For most people, it's asymptomatic and um, they may never know, but for others, it may cause symptoms or um, persist and lead on to cancer. Um, so now getting to the childhood cancer survivors, which I think is where we are doing something really unique here. So um, when we looked at the data as we were starting in 2018, um, we were realizing that we didn't even know who are working with childhood cancer survivors that they are at a hugely increased risk for HPV-related cancers later in life. So these are kids that have already had cancer, gone through treatment, had that really difficult situation. And then um, among females, they're f they have a 40% increase in risk for, ch for HPV-related cancers, and among males, 150% increase risk. So these are some um, a population that is a particular risk for, for um, additional HPV-related cancers. Um, so looking at that all together, kind of to summarize the problem, um, part of the issue is that um, childhood cancer survivors start to love their oncologist. <laughs> they've had this really, they've worked with them for years, their families are really connected there, and so they stay there. And they have um, annual visits or, or twice a year visits, so sometimes they're even getting their physicals there. Um, so they may not return to their primary care um, pediatrician. And then when they do, there is some role confusion. Sometimes um, pediatricians think that because HPV vaccine is a cancer-related vaccine and they know they're not supposed to mess with the cancer care for their patient, they think the oncologists are giving it. But what we found is across the state of Texas, no pediatric oncology clinics um, were giving HPV vaccine in, on site. And so we felt like we had a real opportunity to work with that. Um, so um, in Texas, you, um, UT Health San Antonio is the primary site for the Texas Pediatric and Minority Served NCOR. And so this is the only NCOR nationally that is both pediatric and minority underserved. You can see from the orange in the um, graph that we have a huge catchment area across Texas. And there's five clinical sites that are partners, two in San Antonio, one in El Paso, one here in Austin, and one in Corpus Christi. And um, this, these serve um, 113 counties across the state. And the point of NCORS is that um, 
they connect sites and so that they're supposed to um, to partner to in, improve care, improve standard of care, and do research projects together and improve um, enrollment in clinical trials. So this was a really great way to use this already existing network and um, put this program so that we could have a, a, a very wide um, impact. So knowing that, our program goals when we started this in 2018 are to increase HPV vaccine recommendations. We know that the way it works in the US, the way HPV vaccine is, um, you have to have a provider recommendation. So we needed to train our oncology providers to give those strong recommendations using best practices. Um, we used, um, well, I'll talk more about that in a second. So, and then we also wanted to second increase vaccine initiation. That means the first vaccine they get and then completion. For childhood cancer survivors, completion is three vaccines. Um, uh, regardless of their age because they've been immunocompromised. So let me show you where we started. Um, is the, the bars in gray are the United States, in blue, Texas, and then in orange is our, <coughs> our, patient, our childhood cancer survivor patients from our NCOR. And um, so you can see that we were way behind. <laughs> um, at the beginning, 34% um, of females had initiated and only 18% completed. 26% um, of males had initiated and 12% completed. The Texas and um, US rates are from NIS teen, which is kind of our best way of knowing vaccine rates across the nation. So we knew that we had some work to do. So what we set out to do um, to accomplish our goals that we talked about a bit earlier are we delivered um, evidence-based HPV um, provider and staff education each year at across the sites. So what we did is adapted evidence-based interventions that are used in prime in, um, in pedi general pediatrics, but we had there was no information on talking to patients about um, childhood cancer patients about that. And our hypothesis was that parents were going to be pretty excited to get this opportunity to prevent cancer for their children, and you'll, you'll see our results in a minute. But um, we also implemented um, practice level changes to build an HPV vaccine friendly culture across each site. This was very um, individualized by each site. We had some sites where HPV vaccine was not even on the um, hospital pharmacy formulary, so they had to get approval and go up, you know, through their process of even getting it on their formulary. We had others who had given other vaccines but never HPV vaccine. But there was, um, that's really where these funds were super important because none of these sites were gonna be able to um, start this without some funding. Um, and, and now we're moving this on to their standard of care. Um, okay, so then I just wanna get straight to some of our impressive results and then I'll jump to our really impressive results after this. <laughs> So the yellow bar, so these are the same bars, except for that to keep everything fair, um, this is now 2021 data for U.S. and Texas. Before we were looking, comparing our baseline, so it was 2018. So you can see that U.S. and Texas have gotten better than they were in 2018. That's great news for our nation. Um, we still have that 2030 healthy people goal of um, 80%, and they're not reaching it yet. Um, among, so the orange bar was that same numbers you saw before where we were. And now the yellow bars show that um, we have had huge increases in vaccine initiation and completion across the site, um, more than double in all site, uh, in, in all configurations that you look at it there. So then when you look at those overall completion rates, 37% um, of ours have completed versus 52 in Texas and 62 in the general U.S. population. But this numbers are looking at everyone on the vaccine, uh, I mean, on the clinic rosters. So in 2018, what we did is we worked with each site to develop a list of everyone who is age eligible for the vaccine and who was at least six months off treatment. Over time, obviously, we're adding more as they come off treatment. But 30% about haven't been seen again since that time. So they fall, you know, they move or they um, aren't coming back to their their survivorship visits as they're supposed to or other things. So we also looked at the data of anyone who's been seen in our clinics since 2018. So we think this is a little bit of a fair 
um, assessment of the impact of the program, um, there's clearly room for making sure those 30% come back. But um, so the purple lines now are added on, and that's of our um, so that's our 71% who've had a visit. And you can see now that we are well above US and Texas rates for initiation. We're at, we have 87% initiation overall, um, which is also above the 2030 goal, the Healthy People 2030 goal. And um, our completion rates are above Texas average um, and are nearing national averages. Um, the, what, one of the really thing, thank you. One of the things we're really committed to in this program is making sure that it's sustainable and it can become the standard of care across these clinics. And so a deliberate choice that we made was that we weren't going to ask them to bring people in more often and add extra visits. So we are capturing and, and recommending every time they come in. But some of them, that might be once a year. So to get from initiation to completion may take two or three years. So we think so we know that our completion rates are lagging a little bit because of that time um, component, but we think it's still a strength of our program because all of the programs intend to keep doing this after all funding is gone. They have the systems in place now, and it's just part of their standard of care as they um, as they see patients, they recommend the vaccine and they offer it right there on site. <coughs> Um, the other thing, I'll just go back real quickly, is just one other point is that, remember I said earlier, we thought parents, if they were offered the vaccine, would take it. They do. They know how important and serious, um, they, they just know the tragedy and the seriousness of it, cancer diagnosis for their children, and they want to do anything to um, prevent that. And so if we offer it to them and actually have an ability to give it to them on site, they take it, which is amazing. So I just wanted to look at the numbers a different way, just so you have some other ways to look at that. We've Across this um, program, we've given 1,142 doses of the HPV vaccine to these really high-risk children in, in um, Texas. 92% um, of every time they come in, 92% of the time they're getting an HPV vaccine recommendation if they've had it. The, usually the notes we get about the time, those 8%, are that there was some issue that came up and then the providers decided to, to not um, prioritize that in this one visit and they'll get to it the next time. But still, our goal was 90 and we've gotten to 92%. Um, and then that change from um, initial um, completion rates to what we have now uh, represents a 261% increase in vaccination. Um, so these we're so excited to have protected these kids. Okay, next one. We asked a few oncologists kind of what they thought about being in this program and their thoughts about it, and I wanted to share two quotes here. So one said, it's been wonderful to offer cancer prevention in our pediatric oncology clinic. We can emphasize the importance of keeping our patients as healthy as possible. Um, it is so important to offer HPV vaccines at every opportunity. So they're really bought on. To, at first, there was some pushback of like, we're not primary care pediatricians, we don't do vaccines, but they have understood that this is cancer prevention and part of the role of a, um, a survivorship clinic. Okay, next one. And this was like an unexpected consequence that has been really cool. Um, one of the providers said, um, the communication training we received about HPV vaccination and how to deal with hesitancy was a big help as we, get, we began talking to parents about the importance of COVID vaccine for their children. We felt like we were already experts in handling vaccine hesitancy just when everyone else began to think about it. So we had for years now been talking about how do we handle it if a parent has hesitancy or has false information they've read somewhere. Um, we support them and we recognize that um, they're wanting what's best for their children too. And then we come together to to um, address that. And so that was not something, obviously, that we would have ever um, thought about that it helped with that. But we were able to, through our training, um, uh, our trainings that were already set up, provide them with up-to-date information about, you know, there was different, uh, um, early on, you couldn't have a COVID vaccine right next to a HPV vaccine. And so we were able to work with them so that they always were up-to-date on the latest information. And as soon as that um, policy changed, they knew it, and they were ready to give vaccines again. 
Um, I want to say thank you to you all for helping us save lives of children's um, childhood cancer survivors in Texas, and also say that we believe that this program is going to do a much bigger impact than what we've just said. Um, we already have plans to um, submit an expansion <coughs> grant, and we have um, uh, sites on board across Texas to really make this statewide. And then also, um, Dr. Grimes is um, on uh, some committees with COG, Children's Oncology Group, and they are looking at a nationwide um, uh, expansion of this to, to um, help provide it across the nation at pe pediatric oncology sites to make this a standard of care for, for childhood cancer survivors. So thank you again, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shea. Uh, in a short span of two years, from 2018 to 2020, that's quite extraordinary, the, the changes that you're making. And now they're expanding through COG nationwide, and most likely it will expand across the world, given what you've done. You've started this here in Texas. Very proud of that. Are there any questions to Dr. Roosevelt? Oh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Really appreciated it. Two quick questions. Uh, we know the effectiveness of HPV vaccines in general population. I is it known whether HPV in, uh, vaccinations are effective in uh, children who've been treated with good cancer? Um, great question. <laughs> there, um, one of the things we've wanted to do is add on like a, a joint study where we're looking at titers and looking at immunoresponse. Unfortunately, there's not a commercially available titer for HPV vaccine um, the way there is for, you know, chicken pox or other vaccines to know. Um, so we haven't done that ourselves yet. There has been some data out that it's, um, that it's effective. Um, there's also been a lot of studies out on other vaccines for childhood cancer survivors, and they do, like, once you've been six months off treatment, unless they're on immunosuppressants, they're not... Uh, I mean, it is effect. The other vaccines are effective, so we take hope from that. Um, but because um, there haven't, that is why we do three vaccines also, um, just to be. Uh, this the CDC recommends three vaccines for anyone who's had immunocompromising treatment, and so we hope that. But but that is the, a new study that needs to be done in this area. In the, and, and, side of things. and a question about collateral improvement. Um, do you ever look at the siblings of the kids that have cancer and look at their HPV vaccination rates? Um, we have not. That would be really great. So we um, have designed this, again, to be as easy as possible for sites. So we have, haven't collected um, data from patients and families so that we could keep the <laughs> the overhead of the program low. So we're, you know, we're using medical records to look at these things, but that would be a great add-on. We will look into that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Montgomery. Yes, <clears throat> Dr. Shea, thank you very much. It was terrific. I, I wonder how you, how do you account for the, the lag time between initiation and completion? You said that it's oftentimes because they only come once a year, so you have it, but is there, is there something else? It seems odd that if people are very receptive to the idea that, that there would be any lag time? Um, well, I, I think it is explained by their, our clinical oh, it setup. Is. So um, if they get a vaccine, in, they have to have three. And so if they get a vaccine in year one, if they, if they don't have another ah, treatment scheduled sorry. for six months, then completion means they've had three. I'm sorry, treatment. I misunderstood. I thought it was just initial visit, then vaccine was completed, but it's okay. three. Got it. Yeah, the third. Okay. So the initiation means they got one. And yeah. Completion means they got three. Sorry for the, my oh, confusion. No, okay. The other one is how do you reach all these counties, 113 counties? That's <laughs> well, a those lot. Are, those are the catchment areas for, um, for these clinical sites. So pediatric oncology centers are not typically in small rural areas. Yeah. <laughs> um, people travel far. Um, almost all, you guys probably know this, but all, almost all pediatric oncology patients are on clinical trials through the COG. That really is the standard of care. Mm. And so they need to go to these bigger sites where they're getting the standard of care. So if they're in, 
Tennessee and Angelo, where I'm from in Tom Green County, they either have to go, you know, up to Dallas or over to El Paso or, you know, um, they travel far for these. Yeah. Um, so that's really how this catchment area is defined. Yeah. Got it. Thank you very much. D. Do you have numbers on, uh, like, for instance, El Paso, how many are treated there in that area in UMC? I, the Children's Hospital? I don't in front of me, but <laughs> we do for each site. We we um, we are reporting back by county, and then also each site is reporting back to us every quarter on all the vaccines they give in. El Paso actually is one of the biggest um, success stories. They um, they their patients were ready for it. They they had a hard time getting patients to HPV vaccine before, um, and so yeah, they were. Very excited, and El Paso sometimes does have patients coming from from Mexico all Mexico and from Mexico, so it's all um, part of it. Yeah, but we also led the uh, state in COVID uh, vaccines as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, so yeah. we're one of the first cities that did that. So there's a mindset for it. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you. Good morning. Great presentation. You. Uh, yeah. Are you. Kind of beat me to the punch earlier when you said about the COG. I said, why don't you just use the COG as your standard for administering the vaccine, make it part of the protocol. Yeah. And also when you, to complete it, what we learned from, uh, as the mayor as well, we learned from the uh, COVID experience is that to get uh, people to vaccinate or get it to them, uh, we utilize different tools. Uh, I urge you to partner with your school districts, with the cities, the county health departments, because we, we may use our own EMS to, when students weren't coming in, we went to them. So we make sure we vaccinate the entire family plus the students if need be. So if there's people missing because of work, parents have to work or they just can't make it in, you can always use uh, local assets to help you if, you if you like in the partnership to go deliver that vaccine to those kids so you don't miss anybody. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Shea. Very much appreciate your presentation. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I request that Dr. Smith introduces Dr. Kartik Krishnan and Matthew Head from Onco Nano Medicine to provide the com company's update. Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Smith. Good morning. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kartik uh, Krishnan and Matthew Head. Um, from Onco Nano Medicine. Uh, Onco Nano Medicine has received three CEPRT awards uh, for a total of 31 plus million dollars. And uh, the first award that they received was in back in 2014. Um, Dr. Krishnan um, came to uh, Onco Nano as the uh, Chief Medical Officer in June of this year. He has over 20 years of experience with experimental therapeutics in cancer as both an investigator and a sponsor. And prior to Onco Nano, um, Dr. Krishnan was CMO of Arcus Biosciences, a discovery and clinical development company which focused on combination therapies in immuno-oncology. Um, Matthew Head is the chief financial officer at Onconano. He joined the company in March of 2018. He has over 25 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. And prior to Onconano, uh, he was the head of um, finance for ZS Pharma, which was acquired by AstraZeneca in 2015. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you doing? So, I'm Matthew Head, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Onco Nano Medicine. And I would just like to say thank you for your continued support of Onco Nano over these years. It dates back to 2014, but many of you don't real, may not realize that CPRIT also helped support the venture research at UT Southwestern Medical Center from which we licensed this technology. So this is a long-standing relationship that has happened with this technology all the way from the bench into now we've got a phase two trial and clinical asset that will be moving into its phase three pivotal trial next year. So this is an exciting opportunity for us. And then not only that, I you know, also thank you as equity holders in our company too. So we were able to convert some of those grants into equity. Um, so I will save you from having to hear the finance guy talk about the science. So we've got Kartik with us, as you, and his credentials are immaculate. So I'll let him kind of take it from here and talk about our technology. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, the top of the slide, Matthew covered uh, those bits, and I'm going to talk about the technology. We actually have two different technologies that we've given 
easy to remember names, the onboard and the omni, but both operate under essentially the same principle, which is that they are pH sensitive micelles that exist essentially as balls in physiologic pH and dissociate, dropping their payload uh, in the target tissues where the tumor is. And it's very tumor uh, specific and sensitive. Go ahead, next slide, please. <coughs> so, uh, as I will go into some more details on both Omni and Onboard, here's sort of where the programs are. So, Omni uh, is currently, let's say, late preclinical, uh, about to be early clinical uh, trials. You see that the arrow is right at phase one. Um, and I'll detail the science behind that and the, the clinical plan for that in a few slides. Onboard um, is the asset that is furthest along in, in clinic with pegcitocyanine. That is in peritoneal carcinomatosis in phase two with an eye towards phase three uh, to begin in 2023. In addition, the onboard technology will be utilized to uh, complete the pivot towards therapeutics for, for Onco-Nano as it is a technology that should be a targeted uh, drug delivery system uh, to combat cancer. Next, please. So as I said, Omni uh, is the, the first of the therapeutic uh, projects that, that I'll uh, discuss. Next, please. Um, and this is a, the, the Omni platform targets Sting as an agonist. So uh, Sting in the normal physiology is part of the body's host defense system against viruses. Uh, the, the viral nucleic acids uh, trigger a cascade of effects uh, through a number of enzymes, ultimately converting uh, uh, guanosine and adenosine monophosphates into cyclic guanosine adenosine monophosphate, or CGAMP, um, which is the ligand for STING, which stands for the stimulator of interferon genes, and in so doing, turns on the inflammatory response to combat virally infected tissues. Um, the inflammatory response has been, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, transformative of the paradigm against, uh, of, of cancer treatment, um, and Sting actually activates both the T cell, or the adaptive immune response, as well as the innate immune response in the myeloid-derived cells, so is, is potential uh, uh, extension of our anti-cancer armamentarium. Go ahead, next. There have been sting agonists in the clinic. Um, they have not transitioned to really transforming uh, cancer treatment due to uh, a number of limitations. Uh, for the systemically delivered sting agonists, the activation of sting outside of cancer uh, generally results in, in profound inflam inflammation and toxicity. For the sting agonists that have been delivered intratumorally, the half-life of those compounds in terms of sting activation has been very short. Uh, at a recent presentation, one of the probably most advanced intratumoral sting agonists was demonstrated to have a half-life in the tumor of about 20 minutes, so which is hardly enough to, to really drive inflammation and cancer. Um, O&M501, or the, the therapeutic based on the Omni platform, actually has a number of advantages, we believe, over the, the previous sting agonists. One of them is that it delivers CGAMP itself, um, as opposed to other uh, cyclic dinucleotides, to the tumor. And the second is that the polymer itself stabilizes the sting molecule, potentiating its activity and, and potentially allowing for increased inflammation. Go ahead, next. Thanks. So a lot on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, the, but essentially, the preclinical uh, work that has been done on O&M501 demonstrates that it is a differentiated uh, sting agonist when delivered into, into uh, tumors uh, in tumor-bearing mice. The immune infiltration increases, and this increase is. Uh, accentuated when given in combination with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, the anti-PD-1s or PDL-1s that are uh, standard of care treatment in cancer. Uh, importantly, when given to uh, non-human primates who are not tumor-bearing, that we do see systemic inflammation, but this is non-adverse, it's reversible, um, and should allow us to deliver actually a high level and with a wide therapeutic index 
uh, O&M 501 into cancer patients. And importantly, on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, when, when uh, O&M 501 is delivered into, the, into tumors, it is retained there for, and this, this graph goes out only to 48 hours, but it's probably even further than that. There is some drainage of, from the tumor into the lymph nodes, which is, I'm going to say, not necessarily a bad thing. That is where inflammation lives and where cancer frequently goes. Um, if you were to inject uh, the, the sting ligand, CGAMP, into cells, and this is the, the lower panel on the right. The sting protein moves to the lysosomes very rapidly and is degraded. Um, whereas using the O&M501 polymer, sting is actually sequestered away from the lysosomes in the cell and is retained. So we think that we have, yeah, honestly, a better mousetrap. Next, please. So where are we with, with O&M501? Again, this is work that has been largely supported by CFRIT, so uh, thanks. There will be many thanks during this presentation. <laughs> um, so the, we're completing the last of the preclinical work. We've submitted our pre-IND package to you know, essentially lubricate the, the completion of the IND. We will submit the IND in the first quarter uh, of next year with an eye towards enrolling the first patient around the middle part of the year, end of Q2. Um, we've selected a CRO. There is site selection. I use air quotes usually when I say site selection since we are going to the same sites that we would, that have done these trials before. I'm actually visiting a site later today here in Austin. So um, I've uh, talked to a number of investigators about this program who are very excited, including a couple that are here in Texas. Next, please. And this is just a, a schematic of what the, the phase one clinical investigation would look like. Uh, I put this up here to note that the FDA has um, migrated a, a little bit, as they are wont to do, in terms of how drugs are being developed, especially and probably inclusively in oncology, requiring some more phase one work and dose optimization. And I will say that, that we have... Uh, endeavor to build this, this investigation to allow us to move as quickly as possible f by demonstrating proof of concept in phase one to registration, ultimately, commercial safety. Next, please. With that, I'll switch gears to the other uh, platform that I'll talk about, which is the onboard platform. Next. So the, the onboard is, as uh, described previously, it's a pH-sensitive polymer that exists as a micelle uh, in physiologic pH, but in the highly acidic tumor microenvironment uh, that dissociates into its monomeric uh, molecules as well as depositing the payload right there. So there's a number of things that uh, we can potentially encapsulate. Uh, the imaging agent there, the, the the middle is what I'll spend some time uh, talking and really showing pictures uh, about. But uh, the possibilities actually are, are, you know, as the infinity symbol down the lower right says, essentially endless. The, our, our scientists, again, supported by CPRIT, thank you, um, <laughs> have, have been able to encapsulate a large number of, of different flavors of molecules that we think we can uh, provide a high intratumoral concentration and a wide safety margin to patients. It's just a matter of choosing the right ones. Next, please. So I'm going to skip this slide, please. No. Sure. So so uh, the cartoon in the, the top right is essentially what I said, that uh, the polymer and physiologic pH uh, sits as a ball, or M&M, &M, as I like to call it. Um, and in the acidic environment, the, the, it, it dissociates. In addition, in the lower uh, right panel, one of the other features of cancer that makes this a particularly specific uh, moiety is that the vasculature in cancer is quite leaky, allowing it to the, the micelle to permeate at high concentrations into, into cancer. Um, but the, the micelle itself circulates around, and it's really the, the pH change and the transition point that is built into the technology that allows the deposition of the payload. In, for pegcidocyanide, which is our lead asset, the payload is a fluorophore um, and allows for fluorescence uh, appreciation of where cancer is 
and where it isn't. Next, please. So with that, we drew, uh, we started a phase two trial. I'll just let the video play. It really sort of speaks for itself. Um, the design of the phase two trial is that uh, one to three days prior to uh, surgery, and these are patients with peritoneal metastasis who are eligible for cytoreductive surgery, um, they will get a, an injection, a single infusion of hexidocyanide. And then at time of surgery, the surgeon will perform the, the surgery that the, they would normally do for cytoreduction, uh, which involves uh, identifying cancer and excising it. And the identification is through visual and tactile clues. Uh, following that standard of care surgery, uh, the, the operative field will be uh, investigated <coughs> using a near-infrared near camera. And fluorescent uh, material will be uh, excised and set to pathology. The idea being that anything that fluoresces after the standard of care surgery is likely to be uh, cancer. So, and that was uh, the video uh, that, that showed, which was a, uh, a standard of care surgery had been completed and a fluorescent uh, piece of tissue that I will tell you was, in fact, uh, found to be cancer, uh, was excised after, allowing for a more uh, complete cytoreduction. Next one. So with a, without the uh, motion of video, you can appreciate uh, the images there on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the, this is a uh, colon cancer patient with, uh, who was found to have a disease in the left upper quadrant after the standard of care surgery. The operative field is, you know, when you look at that, I'm not sure you would identify where cancer is. If you look at it really carefully, maybe you can guess. But guesswork in surgery is not really uh, preferred. <coughs> so looking at it either under the simple near infrared light or with using the, the transformation of the, the heat map, um, area of residual cancer is, is relatively easily identified uh, and can be excised. We have, uh, at the time of the interim analysis, the data for which I'll show you in a second, we had done 32 surgeries, or 32 patients had been enrolled, um, who had a wide variety of tumor types uh, that are known to metastasize in the peritoneal cavity, um, with no real difference, appreciable difference, uh, based on the tumor type. Go ahead, next. So this is uh, data that was presented at the World Molecular Imaging Conference by Dr. Wagner, one of our lead investigators. Um, understanding that in a recent registrational trial, uh, appreciation of cancer after the standard of care surgery, what we term clinically significant events, the registrational bar was set about 10%. We found that of the 27 patients who were evaluable, that is, were able to get the full dose of pexidocyanine, have the surgery, and have a pathology examination of their specimen, uh, 17, or sorry, excuse me, 15 of those 27 patients had these clinically significant events. So that's 55%, which is, um, I'm going to say when I joined Alcodana was a surprisingly high number, I think. Um, and, and the surgeons who are performing the surgery, they are also, I'm going to say, pleasantly surprised. I don't know if that's right. Um, but there again, you can see this is a, 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 an image of a patient's bowel that looks like bowel in the operative field, but under uh, infrared uh, visualization is, is actually uh, demonstrated to have residual cancer that was neither visible or, or palpable. Go ahead, next. So this is just uh, a schematic of why we believe that the onboard technology takes advantage of uh, advances in nanotechnology as well as protein engineering and really moves beyond that. Um, again, I want to highlight the fact that uh, in the, the surgical field, um, you know, I'm not in the business of telling surgeons how to operate, but and uh, the ability to do a more complete cyto reduction we think will be a, a positive, taken as a positive uh, for that. So, next, please. Yeah, I'll get back to that. All right. Thanks, Kartik. So uh, this pretty much gives you what the upcoming milestones are for our company and the roadmap on which we're going to uh, move forward with each of these programs. 
Uh, but what it really points out is 2023 is a very important year for Onconano. Um, as you can see in, in the surgical imaging agent, we've got a interaction with the US FDA planned, our end of phase two meeting. And then expectations are to move that into its phase three pivotal trial um, in the middle of next year. And with, for the sting activator, o and uh, the sting agonist, o and 501, the plan is to submit our IND at the beginning of the year in 2023. And with uh, positive feedback, we will move that into our first in human safety trials as Kartik outlined what those were uh, in, in the middle of the year as well. So 2023 is going to be a busy year, also a pivotal year for milestones for our company. Um, additionally, we've got um, our scientists in our labs. They're, they're uh, coming up with what other payloads work well with the onboard MyCell. And um, we expect in the period of the next few months to nominate what our next, our second therapeutic candidate will be. And uh, we will begin the IND enabling work on that program next, uh, next year as well. Next slide. So this is just a couple corporate items. Um, from an IP perspective, we've got good, a robust IP portfolio that goes out to 2037 to 2040. Um, on our programs right now. Um, it's a constant area of uh, vigilance for us. And then, uh, you know, kind of from a, from a financial standpoint, we ended September with about $35 million in cash, and we estimate that will take us into the back half of 2024 um, in terms of cash, a cash runway. And it's a, uh, you all have seen the markets today and, and how it's been going lately. And uh, it's a little bit of a tough fundraising uh, environment right now. So uh, being in a position where we had just closed our Series B at the end of last year and, and being a little cash heavy has been a good position for Onco Nano and allowed us to continue to move forward on our programs. Um, next slide. So I will not go through this whole slide. This is pretty much a summary of what Kartik and I have um, it, you know, gone through today. I just wanted to say thank you once again for your continued support of Onco Nano, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Head, uh, Dr. Krishnan. Um, I have two questions, Dr. Krishnan. In 501, you use a dinucleotide. Why not a mononucleotide or a trinucleotide? So, so uh, the way the sting protein is activated is the, the dinucleotide actually fits and causes a dimerization okay. of the sting. So it's, it, that, that is the true native ligand of, of sting. Is I see. Thing. Thank you. And the second question is on the onboard payload. It's, it's, it's interesting that you use, the, the, the team use the word payload. It seems that whoever picked it must have been in a quartermaster in the <laughs> artillery. <laughs> my, my brother was a fighter pilot. So. No, that explains it. <laughs> that explains it. But in, in that payload, is it a mono payload or can you put multiple? And it, what's the next trial going to be, so logically speaking? That's the, what we'll do there. So far, we've done single payloads. There, It makes the understanding of uh, the activity and deposition, even in the preclinical models, much easier than when you put in uh, multiple things. The the likelihood is that it will be an onboard molecule in combination with some standard of care agent. Likely, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor will be how those will be developed. Um, with the one sort of way to think about it is if there are molecules that can't be given because of systemic toxicity, can't be just given IV because they perfuse the normal tissues and have a limited therapeutic index. Here we are aiming for a therapeutic window that is very tumor specific um, and then go into uh, the particular details of how the polymer dissociates. But the, the microenvironment of the tumor is actually more highly acidic even than skeletal muscle that's exercising or, or anything. So it is very specific for the tumor itself. And we think that we can uh, deposit molecules that can't be given systemically within that tumor and really affect the, 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 the tumor itself. 
And the last question, I'm sorry, to the committee, <laughs> is that uh, I just wanted to know, do the missiles cross the blood-brain barrier? That's a good question. I, I don't, I, we, we haven't, my, my, uh, my guess is yes, they're, they're pretty small. Um, certainly for uh, brain malignancies, we can have a long discussion about what the brain, the blood-brain barrier is doing in those. I happen to be a neuro-oncologist. <laughs> um, uh, by, by default, really. They, 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 <laughs> when I started my academic career, they decided that I should, since I was a new guy, I had to take all the brain tumors. Um, so it, my, we have not examined in preclinical models uh, uh, brain tumors themselves, but there is some interest even with the imaging agent in gliomas, um, and we think that it'll probably work there. Thank you. Are there any further questions? So just to add on, the, the term payload, we're from Texas, and I like to say we build the pickup truck, and <laughs> we can decide what to put in the back of the pickup truck, right? You know what the Texans so we look at payload definitions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, and congratulations on this great work. I was going to ask the question, I'm sure that's obvious in your mind, that is um, things that have been previously somewhat promising but too toxic. So the history of chemotherapy could be revisited, I suppose, with a new, very focused delivery system. Is that fair? That that is fair. In fact, that is that is the approach that I'm taking, and especially with uh, molecules that are immune activating agents. So the class of molecules that are CD28s or CD3s that are bispecific. So trying to recruit the innate immune system, but do an excellent job of that everywhere. This is uh, potentially a way that yeah, that we can deliver it directly to the tumor without those systemic effects, and for sure, that is what we're thinking. Thank you. And any further questions? Hearing none. Mr. Head, Dr. Krishnan, thank you very thank much you. for thank that you. wonderful thank you presentation. And we thank you in return. <laughs> 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 Mr. Roberts will provide the Chief Executive Officer's report. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, this, um, I think, unfortunately, is going to be our last meeting in the extension. Um, it is our hope, uh, and I've mentioned this previously, uh, that we will be able to have future meetings in the Barbara Jordan building, which is between where we are right now and our home in the Travis building. Um, if, for some reason, our access to that meeting room is delayed. Uh, we unfortunately will probably have to meet in February in our staff offices. And I think all of you have been in that conference room. It's not ideal, but it will will work. Uh, but I'm going to be optimistic that we're going to be in the in the Jordan building. Uh, as I always do at these, I mean, of course, this is the the second meeting uh, this fiscal year, first regular meeting in this fiscal year. Uh, there are plenty of funds remaining. Uh, if you decide to go ahead and approve the recommendations that are coming before you today, uh, we will still be in the black. Uh, if we aren't, then I have some real problems. Um, I want to point out that um, we are, for the first time since I've been here, approaching full employment at CPRIT. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, the new person I have to introduce today is Justin Rand. There he is. Stand up and wave at him. He's been, <laughs> he's been moving around uh, taking pictures, but uh, he's helping out in the communications activity um, and is a strong addition to the staff. Uh, we have another new employee, Carlton Allen, who is going to be a program manager shared between research and prevention, and unfortunately, Carlton couldn't be here today. I just kind of want to editorialize here that uh, I think that as we sit here today, this is probably the strongest, as an aggregate, the strongest staff we've had at CPRIC. And I attribute that for a couple of reasons, um, not only the, the mission of the agency that attracts people, 
But I got to say, uh, being an old guy, that the telework policy has enabled us to hire people I don't believe we'd have been able to hire previously. Uh, and the caliber of the staff has improved. Um, and again, the ability to work, you know, whether it's in Lubbock or Tyler or Houston right now, um, we don't miss a step. And I intend to report that to the legislature when they convene in January. Uh, but I, as I said, being an old guy, was skeptical, but I was proven wrong. So uh, as I sit here, I'm very proud of the people we have with us. Uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Patel, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. There's one thing the Oversight Committee should be aware of, uh, the so-called old guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not talking about Mr. Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> but you could. Uh, you could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> Is that we have a, a gentleman here who has served 45 years in the service of Texas. And that's quite extraordinary, uh, Ms. Roberts. Your service to this state, to this committee, is beyond words. And I on behalf of the committee, say thank you very much. Well, we applaud I, you. I, 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 I appreciate that, but I do know for a fact that some of the people I work, I have worked with over those 45 years will say it's because I've been unable to get gainful employment <laughs> in the private sector and that I have been on the public dole for the last 45 <laughs> years. But be that as it may, I, I appreciate the the acknowledgement. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Dr. Hernandez, ready? No. Oh, no, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Burgess to present the Chief Compliance Officer's report. Mr. That wasn't me. <laughs> that, that was his pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the little known <laughs> mental pacemaker. <laughs> he woke up. <laughs> you know, if the compliance comes on, everybody does. <laughs> true, true. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, Oversight Committee members. You know, as I was preparing for today, uh, I was reminded of a, a quote from uh, a modern day thought leader and some say philosopher, the Honorable William Montgomery. And, <laughs> and he said, I quote, compliance doesn't matter until it does. <laughs> and I think these are wise words. And I think that uh, we have tried our best as a compliance team to maintain a uh, diligent and proactive posture in our compliance. And I just want to thank you for your support in that and Wayne's, uh, Mr. Robert's support in, in that um, <coughs> Mr. Endeavor. Burgess, if you just look under the desk, your check is there. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Behind tab four, you'll find my compliance officer's report. I will briefly highlight uh, activities from the last uh, three months. And then also every November, uh, I provide uh, a summary of the previous fiscal year's activities. So on 4-1, uh, uh, in terms of our delinquent reporting, uh, the, as it, at the end of October, we had five delinquent reports. Three of those were academic research and two were product development research reports, well below our, our threshold of 28. Uh, I think uh, we, a team, again, we meet weekly, and I think we do a really good job of trying to stay on top of, of those delinquent reports. Um, as you are aware, the compliance program uh, provides a second level review for all of our financial status reports. And so they come into uh, the agency, the grant accountants review those, they come to the compliance team for a second level review, and we've reviewed 541 of those, about 11% of those required resubmission. 4-2, uh, we completed eight enhanced desk review reports over the last three months, working with one grantee to remediate those findings, uh, completed seven uh, on-sites, virtual on-sites, uh, and working with five grantees to remediate findings. 
In terms of annual match expenditures reviews, so as you are aware, most uh, I mean, product development grantees and those academic research grantees that their match doesn't offset, I mean, their, um, that word. Whatever. <laughs> credit, federal yes, credit. Their, yes, their credit. Uh, doesn't uh, offset their match. Um, we review all their expenditures. And so we've reviewed a little under $9.5 million this year with no disallowances. And so uh, as you'll see later, that's been a, a decreasing every year we've done our match reviews. see what a uh, training and support we are really big on that uh, we've completed uh, four uh, new authorized signing official trainings over the last three months uh, A&M Corpus Christi Rice University uh, Southern Methodist and a hummingbird a new product development uh, ASO and we completed our third and final series of uh, annual compliance trainings uh, October 12th through 13th and all of our grantees met that requirement for this year on to the fun stuff. So 4-3, uh, summarize activities from FY22. Um, our average monthly delinquent reports were at 11 this year. We kind of crept up from 10. Um, but you can see we're, we're kind of hovering around that, that space over the last uh, few years. Again, well below that 5% threshold that, that we have uh, kind of imposed on ourselves. 4-4. We completed second level reviews for over 2,000 FSRs uh, in FY22. Uh, the two charts there um, are, you know, we had completed 113 compliance monitoring reviews in FY22, 86 desk reviews, and 27 on-site reviews. That first chart shows you uh, how many we, we completed in terms of on-sites and how many had findings. And that second chart on that page, 4-4, we went up a bit uh, from 38% last year to 63% of our on-sites. We looked at the data and we had several new um, product development grantees and a prevention grantee. All of those had findings and I think of the 17 uh, findings, 14 of those were timeliness of reporting issues. So while we, you know, out of compliance is out of compliance, but a late report is different than some other things. So we're working with those grantees in terms of um, timely reporting. <clears throat> and the last uh, uh, piece I wanted to point out at the bottom of 4-5, uh, the, the last bullet, our annual match expenditures reviews. You know, you can see here in FY21, we reviewed about $16 million and had roughly 8% disallowance. And then last year and in 22, um, we had reviewed 14.7 million and that disallowance uh, rate went down to about 1%. And so far this year, out of the nine and a half million, we've discovered no disallowed um, expenses. So we definitely are proactive working with our grantees, helping them submit the correct ex you know, types of expenditures for their match review. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah. uh, the, How are we doing on the repeat offenders? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so a great question. Um, this year, it, for our uh, annual attestation, um, we are putting in, so if you've had a finding uh, this previous fiscal year, two years in a row, we are asking for you to uh, provide uh, documentation that you've actually remediated that and we're testing to that. So those will go out in December. Those with our improving. Hand. I mean, I recall in the past, same people, same organizations. We have some re we have some repeat offenders, and and uh, you know we early this year, matter of fact, we had and required one of them to have a an ad hoc training where we went through and and had a very specific training to that grantee to say here are the things that you're not doing correctly, and we see it over and over again, um, and so we we. We do that, and then again, this year we're trying to, um, any finding that you've had, that you've had two years in a row for a review we've done, you're going to provide proof that you've remediated that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always concerned when compliance comes up and then we have an internal audit because it causes heart palpitations for Mr. Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to 
the certification of the award slates uh, that we will consider today. Mr. Burgess will provide the compliance certification report for the two recruitment awards presented today. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And, and please don't look under the table. There's an, <laughs> right. there's an IOU there, that's all. In your proposed grant award booklet on page uh, 15, you'll find my compliance certification uh, report. This was made available to you in the portal. My memo is dated November the 3rd. Uh, for your consideration today, there are two awards, so one mechanism for the recruitment of established investigators, um, probably the least amount of awards I've ever certified in the few years I've been here, just two. Uh, but I've conferred with uh, GDIT, which is our third-party grants administrator, and BFS, which is our third-party observer, and reviewed all the supporting documentation they provided to me, and uh, I'm confident and certified that uh, the review process was followed, and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Burgess. I appreciate it. The Chair recognizes Dr. Lebeau to provide the Academic Research Programs update and introduce the Program Integration Committee's Grant Award recommendations. Dr. Lebeau. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Good morning. Can you go to the first slide? I'll refer you to uh, tab Five for the academic uh, research update in the agenda book. We'll present the um, Program Integration Committee's recommendations for the six RFAs that are described here in um, early in, in the agenda book in uh, early 2023. The um, Scientific Review Council. Um, well, excuse me. We'll, we have three action items for today uh, for my presentations. Today, um, I'll be presenting the um, Scientific Review Council and Program Integration Committee recommendations for FY23 for recruitment cycle FY23.1 and the FY23.2 proposed RFAs. Next slide, please. The um, Scientific Review Council and Program Integration Committee recommendations for FY23 include two awards for uh, <coughs> recruitment awards that total um, 11 um, million, uh, just under $12 million. And these are shown in table one on page three of the proposed grant awards book. The priorities that are addressed by these two recruitments, both of which are recruitment of established investigator awards, are shown in Table 2 on page 3. And they include the recruitment of outstanding investigators uh, to Texas, as well as advancing uh, research efforts in drug discovery. And both the investigators' work long term will also inform um, the development of innovative clinical trials. Can go to the next slide, please. The recruitment of two established investigators are summarized here, and I'll go into just a bit more detail. The first is Dr. Rugang Sang, who um, has been proposed by the University of Texas ND Anderson um, Cancer Center for an established investigator award from CPRIT, an appointment as a professor and chair of the Department of Experimental Therapeutics. He would be coming to Texas from the Wistar Cancer Institute, where he is um, a professor and deputy director. Um, Dr. Zhang is internationally recognized for his discoveries that are related to um, elucidating the mole molecular mechanisms leading to ovarian cancer. And um, his work, in particular, has created new concepts on the impact of epigenetic changes on um, ovarian cancer, and the therapeutic strategies that have been developed in his laboratory have now entered uh, clinical testing um, as potential practice-changing treatments. Um, he'll extend this work here in Texas, and a unique aspect of his work is that he'll integrate the epigenetic alterations that occur within the tumor cells themselves 
with those um, cha epigenetic changes that are occurring in the tumor microenvironment, that's the cells that surround um, the tumor cells and um, alter uh, the behavior. And he'll integrate this information to develop um, new therapies with the overarching goal of addressing unmet clinical needs in ovarian cancer. The second candidate is Dr. Uh, Keith Chen, who has been nominated by Houston Methodist Research Institute for also for an Established Investigator Award, and is a appointment as a professor and director of translational research in the Department of Urology. Um, Dr. <coughs> Chen is an internationally recognized genitourinary um, cancer translational scientist currently at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And similar to Dr. Zhang, he integrates research on both the tumor cells and the um, surrounding uh, microenvironment cells. For example, he's made key advances in defining cellular markers that define bladder cancer stem cells and has used this information to develop new um, um, diagnostic and prognostic tools for bladder cancer. But he also investigates how uh, cell death occurs and how the factors that are secreted during this process of cell death um, influence both the tumor cells and the surrounding immune cells that surround the tumor cells and um, alter the immune response and the response to immunotherapy. So his goal is to integrate um, basic and translational research to um, drive innovative uh, genital urinary research and investigator-initiated trials. And I should mention that um, he has a uh, uh, track record and interest um, in establishing um, early phase uh, companies that um, are involved in developing new therapeutics. Um, I would be happy to address any questions that you may have on these any questions? investigators. Okay. Please proceed. Next slide. Okay, the next item is um, several proposed um, RFAs for 23.2. Um, there are four shown here, and if I might, I'd like to start with the, the bottom three and then go back to the, the, uh, the first one. The um, first award um, shown here is the, uh, or the second award shown on the slide is the Trek Pilot Study Award. And um, these three awards are designed to um, help build infrastructure and capacity at the truck eligible institutions, which you may remember are the institutions that um, are, have a, uh, are located um, 100 miles or more away from the NCI designated cancer centers, have smaller research programs, um, and a smaller funding base uh, for cancer research, and are uh, actively uh, growing their uh, research programs. The pilot study award would provide short term funding to allow investigators to explore the feasibility of specific research projects that, if successful, would contribute new insights um, into the etiology, diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of cancers and form the basis for uh, successful applications to apply for peer-reviewed funding from CPRIT or to other uh, organizations. The second award is the TREC Institutional Postdoctoral Training Award. And this is an award that would be made to a TREC-eligible institution to support the training and conduct of research and ultimately the retention as faculty of outstanding uh, postdoctoral students who were, have been recognized by their institution as having particularly high potential and strong interest in pursuing careers as independent cancer researchers. The third award is a TREC Major Instrumentation Award. And this would um, award would solicit applications from track eligible institutions to enhance their research capacity by supporting the purchase of major instrumentation um, to support one or more core facilities that would provide services to multiple investigators 
and we're particularly interested in those supporting cores that support uh, a large number of investigators, but also cores um, that may, um, uh, equipment that may um, provide interactive services and support uh, research that would involve a continuum of research across multiple cores. So the last award that I'd like to present to you um, is a called the um, Texas Connect for Cancer Prevention Study Award. And I'd like to take just a moment to describe this to you because it's a, a new type of award um, for this group. Um, this award solicits applications from institutions to establish a Texas Connect for Cancer Prevention Study of 25 to 30,000 adults in collaboration with the NCI Connect study. So if we go to the next slide, please. So who will participate in the Connect study and why? Um, the Connect for Cancer Prevention study is a new prospective study. It's a cohort of adults in the U.S. that is designed to investigate the etiology of cancer and its outcomes and to inform new approaches to uh, in prevention and early detection. The new cohort will um, capitalize on research innovations such as um, new wearable technologies for, that will uh, provide uh, and measure data on um, behavioral um, aspects and um, environmental um, components. Um, environmental assessments, as well as um, large-scale molecular profiling of tumors and precursor lesions to um, using a broad array of omics technologies to inform biological studies. And the CONNECT study will uh, be conducted within a set of integrated healthcare systems across the U.S. to recruit 200,000 members between the ages of 40 and 65 years of age with, uh, who have no personal history of invasive cancer. So what will occur in this study? The uh, consented participants will complete online questionnaires um, at baseline and periodically throughout the duration of the study, as well as provide access to their electronic medical records. Uh, biospecimens such as blood will be collected at baseline and repeatedly during follow-up, enabling Connect to longitudinally observe changes over time in this adult population which is an interval when people are at the highest um, risk of cancer. Uh, where is the study connected, um, conducted? Well, NCI is leading the study. Um, the initial contracts for study recruitment were awarded to nine healthcare institutions across the United States. And NCI has uh, already developed the data ecosystem and open source code, the questionnaires, and the tools for epidemiological studies and the web uh, app, mobile uh, apps including the apps for mobile phones. Um, the recruitment phase was launched in July of this year, and it will continue for five years through 2027. The, the when of the project um, is uh, a 10-year period. It'll, because it takes time to understand the development of cancer and the causes of cancer, the study is designed to follow this adult population for at least 10 years. If we move to slide two, or the next slide, thank you. The um, CONNECT was designed to address key research priorities in epidemiology. And the data and specimens will be a resource for cancer researchers and biotech and pharma companies, for example, within Texas, as well as across the nation and internationally. Um, the priorities of the study include um, identification of emerging exposures and further um, elucidation of risk factors that are associated with cancer risk through using uh, novel biomarkers, genomic data, and um, cutting edge methodology. The uh, resource will also include biospecimens and images for studies of the natural history of cancer, the heterogeneity of tumors, and to identify early markers for cancer detection. The goal is to recruit a diverse population reflecting the racial and ethnic distribution across the United States. So what is Texas being asked to do? Um, the Texas sites would seek to recruit 25,000 to 30,000 participants. 
So the last slide just summarizes what are the benefits of participating in the Connect study to both Texas and to CPRI. Uh, the benefits to Texas would be that it, this would ensure representation of Texas's unique population um, in this national study in evaluating uh, modern day contemporary risk factors and biomarkers for cancer and early detection. For scientists in Texas, this creates opportunities for Texas researchers to apply directly to the Connect study um, to, uh, for funding or to other peer-reviewed uh, agencies like NCI or to CPRIT for funding to use the Connect resources, to use the data, and to use the biospecimens for research purposes. Um, in addition, sites can retain portions of um, the samples um, for uh, research within Texas or within their own organization. <laughs> I think this creates extensive opportunities for CPRIT, um, for integration of our programs. This will enable us to consider new RFAs that span the academic research and the prevention programs to assess, um, to access either the local uh, biospecimens or the, the national collect data commons and biospecimens for prevention research and to develop interceptions, and new RFAs that span product development and academic research for developing early detection, diagnostic tests, and interventional oncology applications. Um, that concludes my remarks. I would be uh, happy to address Mr. DiMarco. And this slide just shows you a summary of the academic research program priorities that Mr. Roberts will be presenting uh, later today. Thank you. A couple of questions. I love the, uh, the TREC uh, grants. My assumption, though, is if you've already received, and there have been two institutions that have received TREC grants, would not be eligible for these, or are they eligible for these as all, well? All of the TREC eligible award uh, institutions will be eligible for okay, these. Okay, so these even if they've awards. received a TREC grant, they can still Correct. apply for these. Correct. And on the Texas Connect, my assumption is we have no members in Texas Connect yet. And that's correct. That's the purpose there, of this is to get it out there. There are nine sites in other locations of, this, of the country. None are in Texas. None yet. So this is to start the, the flow. Okay, thanks. Just to kind of piggyback on some of those ideas, it seems like that the trek may be a stretch for a lot of these institutions, so are we encouraging them to apply for more than one of these to try and boost up their, their presence? I, I think that's an excellent point, that um, these three awards are um, designed to build up their infrastructure. And uh, for some, uh, uh, for those institutions who do not yet have a TREC award, I think these will be um, great opportunities to um, uh, develop pilot projects to increase their peer review funding, to um, train and recruit new faculty, and to build up their um, research services through the core facilities. Yeah, it's kind of like a success breeds success mentality in that mm -hmm. you've got to get the ball rolling and sometimes it's just so hard to get off high center and so I like the idea of maybe multiple awards to these Trek institutions to help in various um, holes that they may have in, in getting move movement forward. So I would really want to encourage them to reach out to any of these that might help them. So. And I, I should have indicated that uh, this portfolio of awards was developed with the advice of our Geographic Diversity Advisory Committee, who developed a slate of um, awards and priorities for the track eligible institutions. And this arose to the top of their list. This is great. Yes, it is. And then uh, on the uh, Texas Connect, and the, I don't know, I mean, I, the four and a half years I've been here, I haven't, uh, have we had a collaboration with NCI before? What, what was the genesis of, of how this came to be? I mean, was this on the radar, or did they reach out to us? It seems like that the nine sites in the country that have already been participating, what would prevent a Texas site from going directly to the NCI? 
Um, this is study is being run by the Intermill program at NCI and funded by the Intermill program at NCI. They launched it a few years ago and selected the nine sites, and um, they and as I've said, they developed all, have developed all the the um, databases and so forth the necessary to conduct the study. Um, I was approached um, by Dr. Ned Sharpless and Dr. Steve Chanek, who is the director of um, uh, epidemiology and, and genomics at, um, at the Intermail program, and asked if um, if CPRIT would be interested in considering joining the study. And one of the reasons is because Texas has a very unique population um, and um, would enable the Connect study to expand the diversity of the, the populations that are studied and enrich enrich the, uh, the, the analysis and data in that way. I agree. Mr. Roberts, Dr. If I Dr. could expand, uh, if you took a look at the sites, the current sites for this CONNECT program, uh, you will see the glaring uh, lack of diversity uh, of them. And uh, this made immediate sense to me when Dr. LeBeau and I began to discuss it. Um, but going to the first part of your question, I'm glad, glad you brought it up. I, I was going to say this uh, at the end of Dr. LeBeau's presentation. Um, I am uh, aggressively reaching out to uh, the new NCI director, uh, the newly appointed director of ARPA-H, and to Secretary Becerra, uh, highlighting what CPRT does. They're, they're certainly aware of us, but uh, suggesting that we find ways to integrate uh, and coordinate work that would mutually benefit the programs. And I will be copying you folks on those letters. The first one is about to go out in the next couple of days. Uh, but I think it's time, and I think there's a golden opportunity uh, with the new NCI director to, to do this. And I would be surprised if we do not get a positive reaction. Well, I think it's a gr this is great work, and uh, the synergy of uh, getting away from our siloing and, and of this project with uh, you know, prevention and academic research. I like all of this. I think it's really well done. So good luck with this. Dr. Rice. Dr. LeBeau, I just had a quick question. I'm not sure I'm understanding. For instance, the pilot study, the Trek pilot study, it says it's a 200,000 um, award over two years. Does an institution get that, or does an institution have an interesting pilot it wants to do and then applies for that pilot for 200, and an institution might be able to get one or two or more of those? Or wait, where's the funding actually um, pegged? I just wondered. The pilot awards would be. Um operated in the same way we run our peer review research awards, they would apply directly uh, to this. Our, the the in individual investigator would apply directly. Um, but they're smaller amounts of money and shorter term projects with very defined goals to generate preliminary results. So an institution could have any number of these Correct. applications and the Correct. same for the postdoctoral, an institution might have 20 postdoctoral, I'm just making it up, but any number of applications for the 800 the, per year. The yes. Well, the postdoc award, we, we envision operating uh, differently. That In that case, the award would be to the institution that submits the award and makes the best case and provides the best examples of their postdoctoral training opportunities. Um, and the reason being that this CPRIT would um, uh, delegate and trust the institutions to be able to select the most promising postdocs working with the most talented and uh, mentors. So institutions would have one? Uh, Each, the institution would have one award. One award. With, and that would enable them to potentially distribute multiple postdoc awards. And uh, is that one per award per year or something like this? Yeah. Or? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If, if the program is successful, it might uh, we might be able to expand it um, to to issue more pilot projects or more institutional awards for postdocs. All right, thank you. Uh, oh, please, Dr. Hernandez. So you're saying like UT El Paso? So for the track pilot, let's just say that they can apply for five or six 
of those, or are you saying only they can only have one per? Well, an individual investigator can only apply for. They have one. ten inv investigators. All ten can apply, and they would be awarded if they qualify. All ten would be awarded. N well, an individual investigator can only apply for one, but more than one investigator per institution can apply. Okay. And Dr. Patel, if I could make one more point, again going back to, to the TREX stuff, and I know you, Dr. Hernandez, are aware of this, and I've, I have tried to communicate this previously. Um, there is some really exciting investments coming out of the University of Texas system. Uh, the UT Board of Regents in uh, September uh, committed $145 million for a cancer clinic research facility down in McAllen, I believe it's in McAllen. In addition to that, in the last appropriations bill, uh, UTRGV was given $9 million for the biennium to help build up their research capacity, hiring researchers, lab, et cetera, lab assistants, et cetera, and they are asking the legislature to continue that special item funding going forward. Uh, you know, this obviously affects the Rio Grande Valley uh, but it is, I, I think that it is going to be an example of additional support that can be coming down the line. But this is an enormous commitment to the Rio Grande Valley. Thank you. No, if there are no further questions, then first we will take up the award recommendations and then we will vote for the four requests for applications. Mr. Burgess has certified compliance for the recruitment award processes. It is my understanding that no oversight committee member had reported a conflict with any of the award pre recommendations presented today. Um, are there conflicts of interest that members have not already reported? Saying none. Members, you have the list of applications and grant amounts <coughs> recommended by the PIC for the Academic Research Grant Awards. We will approve the PICS recommendation if two-thirds of the committee members agree. There are two grant recommendations. Rather than taking a separate vote, I will ask for a vote to approve all recommended awards. If a member wants to consider the award recommendations separately, please speak now or forever hold your silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, temporarily. <laughs> I will now entertain a motion to approve the PICS two recommendations for the recruitment of established investigators. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Hearing approval from at least two-thirds of the members, the motion carries. I will entertain a motion delegating contract negotiation authority to the CEO and CPRIT staff and to authorize the CEO to sign the contracts on behalf of CPRIT. So, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Members, closing out our action items for the academic research program, I will entertain a motion approving the proposed fiscal year 2023 RFAs presented by Dr. LeBeau. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. LeBeau. The Chair recognizes Ms. Majid to provide the Chief Prevention Officer's report and the four requests for applications. <laughs> Members, the Prevention Program update is behind tab six of your packet. There were 24 applications received for FY23 Cycle 1 and they're undergoing peer review and the PICS recommendations will be brought forward for your consideration at the February 2023 meeting. And um, we have been working on the um, proposed priorities, and uh, um, Mr. Roberts will present those later in the meeting. CPRIT is recommending the release of four prevention RFAs for cycle two of 2023. And there's um, Three of them have been previously approved by the committee, and there's one new RFA for your consideration. The three previously approved are the um, dissemination of CPRIT-funded cancer prevention and control interventions, 
primary prevention of cancer and cancer screening and early detection. Summaries are in your update and um, the full draft versions were on um, in the data room. The new RFA is a colorectal cancer screening coordinating center. It's the result of um, one of the prevention advisory committee's recommendation and a recommendation of the Prevention Review Council as well. The ultimate goal is to have a statewide colorectal cancer screening initiative, and this RFA establishes the infrastructure needed to implement and oversee this initiative. Um, CPRIT plans to make one award to a single applicant and for a maximum of $3 million over a period of five years. The coordinating center and the um, statewide screening initiative will start with colorectal cancer, but be a model for other cancer screenings, such as breast, cervical, and lung in the future. Um, this concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Ms. Maggett? Okay. Members? I will now entertain a motion approving the fiscal year 2023 RFAs as presented by Ms. Maggot. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to agenda item 10, I will recognize the Chief Product <laughs> Development Officer, Dr. Ken Smith, <laughs> to provide the Product Development Program update. And again, many thanks to Uncle. Good morning again. We have uh, slides. So I'm going to give the update, but primarily today's update will be about the revised review process. Um, and we'll go through some statistics that we have based on um, previous um, <clears throat> processes. And currently, we're in the middle of this process. So this is kind of the preliminary review application process. But before I get to that, we changed also the RFAs that we posted in, in August of this year. And the idea behind that was that we wanted to make um, potential uh, grantees know that CEPR wasn't just funding therapeutic applications, but there were other things that CEPR was interested in, devices, diagnostics, bioinformatics, um, biomanufacturing. Um, so basically, we put together four RFAs, three of them basically are up to 20, were previously up to 20 million. We've uncapped that and talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But those three FRFAs are for companies that are relatively mature. Obviously, we're not funding companies that are in phase three, but these companies have a great deal more data. The companies themselves have, you know, a reasonable um, management team. Um, and these three RFAs, like I said, one was for therapeutics, the second was for devices and diagnostics, and the third one was what we call new technologies. And that encompasses quite a, diff, quite a number of different things, including you know, artificial intelligence, uh, bioinformatics, uh, biomanufacturing, manufacturing radionuclides. Um, we tried to pretty much encompass everything there. And like I said, a, a good portion of that was to encourage companies that said, oh, we don't do therapeutics, CEPRA's not interested in us, to encourage them to apply. And then the fourth one was is similar to what we've had in the past, is the seed uh, RFA, which again is, is encompasses all of that and therapeutics and funds up to three million. So that's kind of stayed the same. So what's changed in the process now is, and, and this has probably been the biggest change, is this preliminary application review. So the preliminary application, unlike prior applications, in the past companies have had to put together 80, 90, 100 page applications which is somewhat onerous. And so we thought that perhaps we could get you know, more interest if, in fact, we truncated. And, and we did this in conjunction with the PDRC and the PDAC, and you know, we had a lot of input. And the idea was basically, let's, let's kind of um, streamline the process so the companies don't have to put as much information in initially, and then we can get an answer back to them relatively quickly. Because the process previously took, uh, you know, a little bit of time, you know, up to nine months in some cases. And so this, the idea was to basically be able to get people, you know, on board quicker. So the application itself now is only about 20 pages long, two pages for an executive summary, 16 slides uh, 
like in presentation form, and then a justification for a budget and the goals and objectives that this budget would support. So I think that's helped a great deal. And the idea was to get them an answer back within three to five weeks. So the way the, way the process works now, the preliminary applications come in every week. And people can apply at any point in time. Unlike the past where there was a deadline for the applications, now you can apply these preliminary applications. They come in every week. And what a GDIT does is they kind of bend them into a particular week. So we've got as many as eight in a, in a week. And the average is usually around four. But those basically get been together. And what we've done with the PDRC, which has 12 members, we basically put them into three different groups of four. And they look at the applications every third week. So they get a set, and then three weeks later, they'll get another set. And as you can see from uh, above, they'll review the applications. They'll score the applications. And then the decision will be made. And what's kind of, I think, good about this process is we've got two cutoffs at this point in time. If you receive a certain score, you're automatically in, and you get to go on to the next step. If you get a, a different score and above, you basically are not part, going to be part of the process going forward. But what we've also tried to do is we're trying to get a much more detailed review for the applicants so that if they want to reapply or if they want to apply for maybe an SBIR, because these companies are applying for lots of different types of grants, we want to give them some feedback that's meaningful. And CPRITS, you know, in many cases has uh, funded resubmitted applications. And so we want to encourage them to come back. If, if it's really a worthwhile project, maybe they don't have enough data. Uh, maybe they, you know, their management team's a little bit uh, short. Um, and so we try and give them, uh, this to me is a very important part of this process, to give them uh, good feedback. So companies will move forward. And, and then in the middle, there's about a, the scoring has a, like a, a, a kind of a nether world where the four PDRC members get together in a teleconference every week and they discuss those companies. And that's actually been a really good part of this process. And, I, and the feedback I get from the PDRC, they really like that. You know, they like to talk about it. But it's, uh, they, you know, I think it's, it's fair in the sense that, you know, the ones that are kind of on the, on the cusp or maybe someone has kind of got an outlier, someone really doesn't like it but the other three do, it gives the, the company an opportunity to actually have a chance to move forward to the next, to the next step. Um, next slide, please. So this is the process overall. So they get through the preliminary application. We have the scoring. Some don't go. And those that get moved forward, basically, the process is very similar to ha how it's been in the past. You have to put in a full application. The deadlines for the full application were November 1st uh, for this particular round. Um, and the, uh, the full application includes an in-person Zoom, basically, a Zoom presentation. And that, those Zoom presentations will be done the week of December 12th this year. So these full applications will go to the reviewers. The reviewers will review them. They'll put questions together. And then those questions will be forwarded to the company. The company will get them in time so that their presentation includes answers to those questions. Because we found that, you know, if they just give a presentation, they might start out with, like, well, cancer is really a bad thing. And there's this many cancers a year. We really want to get to the crux of the issue. And so if they get the questions, we can get right to the point um, and do that. The other benefit, I think, too, to this, this full application review now is, in the past, we had kind of panels that were, you know, set. What happens now is the, the chair and the vice chair of the, the PDRC actually handpick uh, from a pool of reviewers that we have for the particular companies. So now, if it's a device company, there's people with device uh, expertise. If it's an AI company, there's people with bioinformatics background. And so I think, you know, we haven't, we haven't done these panels yet because we're just at past the preliminary stage. But I really do think that um, having that expertise is gonna, gonna benefit the process in, ma in many, many ways. Um, so the full application, like I said, is, is like in the past, they get the full application, the reviewers review it, they do the in-person interviews, and then after those meetings, uh, the, the uh, panel decides whether it moves to due diligence. And a slight change in the due diligence side of this now is that we're going to use a third party, but they're not actually going to be directing the due diligence. The due diligence will still be done, the IP stuff will still be done by outside counsel, but the, the non-IP materials um, are going to be basically the panel that we've put together. If they need additional expertise, we have people in a third party that we can, you know, uh, contact and use them in addition in the due diligence process. Um, but the goal here is, and, and what I've told reviewers, I, I had like 
five training sessions last week is if you get to the point where you get through the full application process and you get the in-person interview and you're recommending them to go to due diligence, the expectation is that we will fund that, right? The goal here is to not you know, have three bites at the apple. We don't need a preliminary review, a full review, and a due diligence to do it de novo, right? So we want to drill down, and if there's problems, like on the IP side, right, a red flag would be the IP council comes back and says, hey, you, you don't have freedom to operate. There are patents out here that cover what you're doing. That, to me, would be a red flag. And in that case, you'd go, okay, we can't, we can't fund this because of that, that purpose. And that's kind of what we're looking for. So otherwise, the goal is to fund these companies if they get through the process up to the due diligence unless there's a red flag. And so, again, the rest of this is kind of just formalistic. The pick will see it, then the oversight committee approval. Um, but that's, that's the same as it has been in the past. Next slide, please. So in that context, we, uh, we have a lot of data, actually, and, and we're trying to compile um, from years past, and Kristen recently gave a, a, um, a talk where a lot of this was, was displayed. I think the interesting thing about this, this particular um, <clears throat> chart is that back in 2012, there were 78 applications that were filed. Well, that, to me, full applications, that's, that was a lot of applications. And even recently, in, in 2019 and 20, you see 65 and 68 applications. And then at the end, last year is where we funded the most 12 awards, and that percentage rate was pretty, pretty high at 25.5%. Um, next slide, please. And we can actually go to the next one after that. That's Keep going. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I think this is the interesting thing for where we are now. So juxtapose those, those numbers right, from previous years to what we have now. We're averaging about four applications a year, right? So you don't have to be a math wizard to, to know how many applications that has the potential for. We're, we're up 200, right? Now, do I expect to see 200? Maybe not, but we really haven't had much drop off. You, we, would, we thought maybe perhaps after the November 1st date came around that you had to have your full application in, that we might see some diminution in, in, in applications. But there were four last week, and four the week before that, and four last week. The only thing that shows maybe a little slowdown is that GDIT, when people start an application, they get an indication that it's, it's started, but you know, then, then it, that's juxtaposed against what's actually finished. Right now, we have 61 that are still in the queue, and of that, 48 have been totally submitted. So there's still another 13. But over the last week or two, we haven't seen as many new applications being started. So we'll see whether that, you know, um, slows down over time. So you can see that, that there were um, 48 applications, basically, that we've received. And eight of those you have to take out because they're pending, right? We still have a process by which it takes a couple weeks to get through the applications and make the recommendations. But looking at it as 40, it's 22 of the companies out of that 40 were invited. Uh, 18, obviously, were not inviting. We have eight pending. Um, so it's a 55% rate that moves from preliminary application to full application. And that, that tracks kind of within the past, you know, the last process maybe was 40%. And again, these, these kind of vary from time to time. It's, it's interesting how really early on, uh, I think we got the first 10 or 11 applications and like nine or 10 of them went through and you're like, oh man, what, what are we going to do? This is not taking anything out because driving this process in many ways was the PDRC's view that they could just take an application like the ones we're talking about with not a lot of data, a lot of information, and they'd be able to separate the wheat from the chaff really easily. These go into this bucket, they're not going. These go into this bucket, they're going. And yet now they, I bet you 30, 40 percent of them get debated. The quality of the applications have been quite high. It, re it really has. And I again, and I think the number of applications is driven by a couple things, right? So CPRT in the past year has done quite a bit of outreach. Went to Bio, went to Israel, did a lot of things along those lines. Money's short, right? For all these companies, I'm sure that Ankanan will tell you that too, money's hard to come by. So that's another reason perhaps that these, and I think the ease of the process also has driven this. So I, I think that the numbers are up in large part for those those three basic reasons. The other thing I thought was interesting too is now you see the total of 13 seed applications. When we first started it, that was kind of an interesting thing. And out of the first, I mean, I don't know, 15, 20 applications, there was only one seed. 
and you're thinking, well, everybody needs 20 million, nobody needs 3 million, right? <laughs> but that's, that's come along now too. So I try not to take too much from this because it hasn't been you know, too long yet, but there are some interesting trends in the, and the one I think is most important is, the, is just the number that we're getting in. Ne next uh, slide, please, that last one. Yeah, so this one just basically you know, shows you where 75 million may not, may not go that far because we're gonna have 10 companies basically come for full person in presentations and they're asking for $149 million. So the, the asks are, are quite large and so we'll have to deal with that as, as it comes along. But uh, that's kind of the process overall and some of the early statistics will keep you informed of other statistics as we get them. Um, but personally, I feel like it's been successful in a couple ways. One, we've driven more applications. And, and we're sending, we're sending um, this coming week, I think we're going to send out um, uh, surveys to the companies to see, you know, what they thought of the process and things like that. So we'll get some feedback from that as well. But I think the applications have been really good. And the PDRC and the, and the reviewers have been great so far. I think they've really kind of set, embraced this. And I think the process, like I said, so far is is encouraging the way it's working. That's all I have. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. Please, Dr. Rice. First of all, Ken, thanks. Great presentation, and thank you so much for the, the work to sort of transform this, because this seems to be transforming. And see, I want to see if I got my numbers right. I think you said in 2022 we had 12 awards, 25% success rate, so that would mean 48 applications that came through. Right. And I think what you're saying is that I don't know how many – fulfilled applications you have now, but are we sort of doubling the rate of fulfilled applications, do you think? Yeah, so we have like, so what happens is too, that we could only accommodate 10 for the in-person just because of the number. One of the, the, the thing I didn't touch upon about the, the, the process is that in the past, in due diligence, we'd have like a third party there and we'd only have a couple PDRC members. Now, that whole panel that reviewed the, the application, the full application, they're also going to do be involved in the due diligence. So the number of people now, and that's why you had to double the reviewers, right? And you guys helped us get more reviewers, and we got to continue to raise that pool because we have 7 to 10 per panel. You review 10 companies, you 70, and we try not to double up. We do. I think there's one person, one reviewer that's doing three companies. But we try and just give each reviewer one company or two because these people are really busy. And especially the ones that have particular expertise, right, they, you know, we don't want to wear them out. And that's, that's part of the issue, too. So we, have, we had 22 ultimately were invited. 14 got their applications in by November 1st. We took the first 10 of those, and those are the ones that will be reviewed. Those that filled their full app, the other four that had their applications in on time but were later than the rest, they're going to move forward to the next cycle. They won't have to resubmit or do anything. They'll get moved directly to the in-person uh, presentation. And when is the next deadline? In other words, you said you can kind of apply any time. You're doing these interval initial reviews. They you bend them into a November. Is the is there only one more bend for the for the um, for the year? No. So there'll be three. There'll be three. It'll be it'll be tied in many ways to your meetings, right? So you the preliminary application can be can be put in at any point in time, but the full application, those who got invited they'll have a definitive deadline. So that was November 1st. I can't remember the, ne the next one off 1st. the top of my head. February, February 1st. February and May. Okay. Thanks. So so they'll move on, on to that. And then that process will just continue. We're still doing preliminary applications, even though we're right in the middle of, uh, of um, the full applications and the presentation. So again, we have to make sure that, that the people aren't overworked, the reviewers aren't overworked. So we're trying to adjust that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you, Ken. Just two real quick questions. So if I understood you right, there's no more meetings at the Marriott where people go to present. It's there's no more what? I'm sorry? In-person presentation. Yeah, it's a, it's a Zoom presentation. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's what it sounded like. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other was, I know we've talked this before about this before, but uh, portfolio diversity. So in your presentation, there was no mention of portfolio diversity. Yeah, I think it's very critical. Yeah, and yeah, um, there is. Uh, just yeah. and just, that's one just wanted to bring it. I know we've talked about it. Just wanted to bring it up. No, and in fact, I was a little disappointed. Probably the wrong word, but I really thought we'd get a little bit more on the device and diagnostic side, right? So 
I, I didn't point that out, but it's still heavily therapeutic. And the other thing I wanted to point out about therapeutic is it's not just therapeutic, right? It's ancillary therapeutic. So if it doesn't mm -hmm. treat cancer directly, but it treats something because of your cancer treatment or drug deliveries also in that group, which, you know, again, could just kind of like Oncononana, you can put any kind of payload uh, in it. But, but, so, but where, I, where I was going, Ken, was say like there were 20 applications for PD-1 antibodies. <clears throat> right. They all scored really good. Are we going to fund 20 PD-1 antibodies? Right, and at the end of the day, my answer, again, I need your help and P PDAC's help and PDRC's help, is that my immediate answer is no, right? We, we, want, we want to, one of the things is we're getting to the point now where we have enough companies to start looking at all of them and see what the coverage is like. And then it'll have to make a, a decision, right? One of the decisions could be, instead of like trying to manage all of this and go, we're just gonna fund the best possible applications we get, which is kind of what we've done in the past. But we might make the decision that we want more devices diagnostics, or we have enough treatment on a particular, let's say breast cancer or some other type of cancer where we, you know, 25 or 30% of the portfolio is actually you know, for that indication. And that's something, again, we really, you know, talking about the 10 more years of CPRIT, that's one of the things we really want to do. And obviously, so, you know, we want so this So I, I don't want to belabor this, but is it, that going to be done at your level where you say, we're not going to fund 10 anti-PD-1 antibodies, or will it come to the board to say, here's what's met the score, how many do you want to approve? That seems like a CEO decision. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent response. And I after 25 on. years of dealing in this venue, I know how to deflect a question. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to discuss that, Dr. Rosenfeld. I, I understand the point. Uh, I also need to make sure we don't get the, the cliche, the cart before the horse. Uh, but that is a good question for us to consider. And Dr. Smith did point out that this is something we're going to have to work with you folks. Uh, and I'm sure through your subcommittee, the product development subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, please present agenda item 11. Wait, wait. Uh, oh, well, was there a question? Uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'll keep, your, I'll keep you, you really short. Sort of got lost you know, in the uh, Dr. Smith, thanks very much. <laughs> I just want to compliment you with Dr. McGee. I think your work bears out the the statement that Mr. Roberts made earlier that we have a very strong staff. I'm a huge fan of the simplification of the process because it's very important for us to support the private sector through your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Dr. Patel, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just want to echo that. I think that what has happened in the last year has tweaked this into a commonsensical approach to how we're going to go out and, and encourage people to submit their ideas. And just to Dr. Rosenbell's point, uh, I get what you're saying about the diversification of the portfolio, but I also would say where we're headed with cancer treatment is with immunotherapy and and many of those are are pdl1 um, agents and we're not seeing that all of them are translating from the approval process and the clinical trial process to success um, in the clinic and so um, there's going to be i think an evolution of which pdl1 is right for you and so i think that I know you're just giving an example, so I'm not trying to, to uh, belabor that, but I'm just saying there may be a role for multiple uh, analysis or, or um, investigations in that. Yeah, it'll definitely have to be uh, nuanced, and maybe I should have said another anthracycline. <laughs> Mr. Opitz. It, it's been touched on, but I'm going to put an exclamation point on this. All of you were here last year this meeting, November last year, where there was a lot of indigestion about the apparent uh, stagnant condition of the product development program. Uh, we were already, we were very aware of the situation, and we'd already internally begun some discussions. But the staff has aggressively in the last year, and I think with Dr. Smith's presentation, you can see uh, that we took your charge seriously. But uh, I do feel that we need to acknowledge that Kristen Doyle led an enormous amount of this, uh, a lot of hours that she put in, in addition to 
her other de minimis duties. <laughs> uh, but in addition to that, Dr. Abria McGee, who's, who you've met, who's relatively, she's new to the staff in the last year. Tracy Davies, uh, Ken, of course, have all been involved in this. And I think this forms a strong basis of what I commented on earlier, so. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, please present agenda item 11 the staff recommendations for CPRIT's program priorities for the fiscal year 2023. Thank you very much. I do recommend that you approve the program priorities for fiscal year 2024 as presented. Uh, as you'll recall, state law requires you to set priorities for the grant programs annually. Each program officer has discussed the priorities proposed with their respective subcommittees in meetings last week. While the FY 2024 program priorities are, are uh, the same, pretty much the same, they are the same as those adopted uh, last November, uh, the document includes some updated text regarding the background and established principles. The new text, which is highlighted for your convenience in, in the, the priorities behind this tab, um, uh, generally reflect uh, our current operations and policies. We're already doing it, but they really, really highlight or emphasize uh, reducing health disparities or broadening the geographical scope of the awards. And uh, I felt that, that the program priorities needed to reflect uh, the invigoration of those two priorities. With uh, that, I request your approval. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts? I will entertain a motion to approve the fiscal year 2024 program priorities. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Next, we will take the internal auditor's report. The chair recognizes Mr. Graves to present the CPRIT's internal audit report and the fiscal year 2022 annual internal audit report. Uh, that made Mr. DeMango quite excited. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Montgomery. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, morning. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I do have four reports uh, for our Update 44 internal audit reports and our annual report, uh, starting with our vendor contract compliance report on page 9-4 of your materials. Uh, happy to come back and report to you for the scope of that audit was over... Uh, compliance of your vendors specific with the terms and conditions of contracts that CPRIT had with them. So we actually dove into those different vendors. We uh, worked with management to select a sample of significant vendors uh, who provide uh, a major service for uh, the agency. We are happy to come back and uh, provide a strong rating with that report based on our procedures with two low risk findings. Uh, those findings included uh, mainly getting uh, some timing differences of what the timing of uh, receiving reports was required in the contract as to when they were delivered. Some were very minor differences. Um, you, it was within days, uh, usually, and uh, the reason those are low risk are because of the constant interaction Seabra had with those vendors during that delay period. So uh, one of those uh, management has elected to accept the risk because of that interaction. And the other actually uh, should get revised is through the normal contracting cycle. Uh, the vendor that that particular item was with, uh, their contract is up for renewal as part of the normal uh, purchasing and procurement cycle. And so uh, there's a chance to revamp that contract and um, clarify some of those, those different timing requirements. Uh, so that one uh, was a, a strong uh, rated audit again our scale is strong satisfactory unsatisfactory so it received the highest rating as far as uh, the remainder of our audits uh, for this year we do have three follow-ups to bring to you today um, starting on page 9-19 with the communications follow-up uh, the communications there were three findings from a prior audit there that we had um, Two of the three were completely remediated. One was partially remediated uh, and expecting to be fully remediated within this calendar year. So that one item that was open uh, was related to website compliance as part of communicating externally from CPRIT. Uh, and the two open items, there were four items, but they all tied to two issues, one being 
tagging metadata on the website and the other providing Spanish translation of the website. Uh, there are currently two contracts that CPRA has that are in the works, and those are expected to be remediated by December of 2022, so through the, the rest of this calendar year. Uh, the, the remainder, uh, or sorry, the governance follow-up on page 9-38 of your materials had one open finding related to monitoring vendors uh, for their internal control environment. That one has been completely remediated. It had to do with monitoring uh, people or vendors who receive SOC reports. And so earlier in the year, as part of our uh, IT remediation efforts and helping design and some of the consulting on designing some of those processes, uh, they actually used one of the templates that we provided to perform the monitoring and, and execute that control. So just um, know that that time was well spent in actually helping improve and remediate ongoing issues. Uh, the last one, 9-31, uh, is our report on disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, due to some of the staffing changes in IT this year that we're all aware of, uh, that has remained consistent. So there are still five uh, items that are partially remediated. Those are uh, content additions to the disaster recovery and business continuity framework. Uh, four of those are requirements from SWARM and one is from another uh, governing body. <clears throat> so with those reports, we have provided an updated summary schedule that you have, um, the, the nice table there. Uh, if you look at the bottom of that, uh, you know, we had as part of what's currently open, there were 36 total findings. There are now eight that are open. Um, so there's there's only eight that we'll be looking at going into the, the next year. And uh, two of those actually um, are from the current year, so six from prior years. Any questions on the reports for the internal audit before I get into the annual report? Any questions? There are none. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Is there a motion to approve the four internal audit reports and the fiscal year 2022 annual internal audit report presented today? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. The chair recognizes Mr. Roberts to present his appointments to the scientific well, I've got one more report, Dr. Patel. Oh, is that so? I, I, I was responding to <laughs> I know you yeah. really want to hear my appointment. <laughs> I was, like, wow, I was somewhat I'm excited. So just keeping us on track this morning. morning. <laughs> I beg your pardon. No, that's, that's totally fine. Pray to continue. So we do have the one report that's actually not my report. It's required by the Texas Internal <laughs> Audit Act. So um, this one is important. Uh, this is in compliance with the Texas Internal Audit Act. We have to file an annual report that discloses the current years, so, so the fiscal year 2022, and then uh, that activity as well as the plan for 2023. As a reminder, you've already approved the plan for 2023 in the August meeting, so that's included in this report. Uh, there's seven sections. All the content of this report is prescribed by the, the state auditor's office, so we're just checking their boxes. Uh, that include uh, disclosures and of compliance with Texas government code, the internal audit plan for 2022 and its status, any consulting services that we completed as your internal auditor. So you'll see in there uh, the remediation activities that we performed. Uh, the external quality assurance review, so that's our peer review uh, that we get once every three years uh, as being a CPA firm in the state of Texas. Uh, that one, you'll see that the date on is quite old. We did have a current one this year. We just haven't received a report yet. So once we get that report out, the next year's will be updated. Uh, the internal audit plan for 2023 that you've, again, already approved. Uh, any external audit services, uh, disclosure on that, as well as the agency's process for reporting fraud, waste, and abuse of so disclosure on that. So those are the seven required sections. And once this is approved by the Oversight Committee, we will... Uh, provide the final copy for secret to post on their website, and then uh, we will file these with the governor's office, the LBB, and the state auditor's office on your behalf. Are there any questions for Mr. Graves now? <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to present? <laughs> no, uh, sure. absolutely not. <laughs> uh, uh, you have to follow the rules fairly <laughs> carefully. Yeah. Is there a motion to approve the four internal audit reports and, and the fiscal year 2022 annual internal audit report presented today? So moved. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. The motion carries. Now, oh, finally, we recognize Mr. Robertson. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, I have appointed um, eight experts to our peer review teams um, for research and prevention. Uh, state law requires your approval of these appointments. At their November 3rd meeting, the Board Governance Subcommittee reviewed the appointees and recommends approval by the Oversight Committee. I will add that they were also reviewed by the Substantive, substantive uh, Program Subcommittees as well, and they uh, also liked uh, the recommendation, so I request your approval. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts or the Board Governance Subcommittee? Hearing none. Is there a motion to approve the CEO's eight appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committees? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. The chair recognizes Ms. Eckel to discuss the proposed administrative rule changes under agenda item 14, tab 11. Thank you. Uh, today we only have a, a final order, so the rules that we first presented at the August meeting are up for final adoption. They were published in the Texas Register on September 2nd, and we did not receive any public comments. These are the rule changes related to relocation costs for matching funds, corrections to financial status reports, supporting documentation, and some um, citation references to the Texas Grant Management Standards. And after approval today, we'll send these to the Texas Register to become final in the code. And that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Eckel? None? Well, members, is there a motion to approve the final order adopting rule changes to the Texas Administration Code or Administrative Code? Chapter 703. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Sachs. We appreciate that. Turning to agenda item 15, the chair recognizes Ms. McConnell to present the Chief Operating Officer's report. Ms. McConnell. Good morning. Um, my uh, Report is under tab 12 in your meeting books. Um, just highlighting a few items that are in my report. Uh, we finished FY 2022 um, with approximately $2.8 million um, in revenue sharing payments in, in that, year, that, that year alone, bringing the total to $7.7 .7 million um, for um, the lifespan of CPRIT um, in terms of revenue, revenue sharing. The majority of the receipts in FY 2022 were from um, the uh, royalty payments as well as milestone payments from uh, Merck and company for, from the sale of Re Wellrig. Um, with respect to our quarterly por performance reports um, and annual performance report actually for FY 2022, um, we either exceeded or met the majority of our measures for the year. Um, the only exception was um, that we had no company re relocations. Our target was one, um, and no companies actually relocated to Texas that we had funded um, during FY 2022. Um, with respect to debt issuance, um, we actually issued all $298.1 million um, of our anticipated uh, debt for FY 2022, and I'll just note that that's just shy of our $300 million cap um, by st uh, statute as well as constitution. Um, and so uh, we actually expect this year also to issue uh, approximately the same amount. It will be $298.3 million. Um, with respect to interest, um, the amount, the, the commercial paper that we issued um, uh, at the, over the summer, um, in sort of $66.3 million, um, those, that interest rate at the time that it was issued is two, was 2.3%, um, and TPFA has c 
can, had to roll that, and so it's been as much as 3.85%. Um, we also issued um, for this quarter, for FY20, first quarter of FY23, $79.5 million of commercial paper, and that initial uh, rate was 3.15, and in the last roll that they did for that, that was 3.7%. So we are seeing interest rates inching up a little bit. Um, we will be issuing um, an, some more commercial paper um, for this next second quarter of FY23 in December. Um, so we'll see what the rates are then. But, you know, they seem to be fluctuating. Um, the last item in my report is um, just an update on the conference um, next year. And um, so our program staff, they've all been working on finalizing speakers, um, and they're starting to reach out to them. Um, and so we hope to have the schedule filled out with speakers um, within the next few weeks and anticipate being able to release the um, conference registration website um, in early 23. So um, look forward to that. Are there any questions before I move on? None. <clears throat> Moving on to the next agenda item, Ms. McConnell, would you explain the recommended contract rules, please? Yes, so under tab 13, you'll find two memos, uh, one for outside council contracts um, and the other for um, due diligence services contract. So um, the, the recommendation from staff is to... Um, for an outside council contract with the firm McDermott, Will, and Emery for an amount not to exceed $185,000 and to increase the outside council, outside council contract that we already have with Norton, Rose, Fulbright um, from $95,000 also to an amount not to exceed $185,000 um, so that both of these firms can perform um, uh, intellectual property due diligence on our property. Uh, product development um, research awards um, or recommended awards um, and um, that is we have two firms so that there is enough um, issues if there are conflicts between the proposed companies and the firms the council there um, the second uh, memo covers the due diligence services contract um, and this is a new contract with Allen Boyd Consultants, Inc., um, for an amount not to exceed $300,000. And this is for due diligence that is everything else except intellectual property. Um, so regulatory issues, pathway management, commercial viability, et cetera. Um, are there any questions? Any questions? Well, we, Mr. Sorry, I meant to ask this about the conference. Do you have any sense of how well attended the conference will be, or do we not know that until you know later when? The I, I guess we won't really know it until registration opens up. But um, with respect, I, I mean, people are anticipating. We've gotten questions about like some of our training grants, um, finding out you know approximately what we might be charging for conference registration fees. So people. Uh, their grantees are aware. And I think it's they're going to go well. What, what my time slot is for speaking. <laughs> probably not yes. Too. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Dr. Rosenfeld. Just another quick one on the annual meeting. So excited that it's moving forward. That's great. Yeah. Um, just, just wonder if there have, uh, have there been any issues that come up that uh, the board should know about? I'm sorry, with respect to. Darn yeah. mask. Um, problem. Me speaking. Or, <laughs> No, no, no problems. Okay, great, thank nothing, you. Nothing we haven't been able to fix. In the free parking. Yes, <laughs> and we might. It's so that, that means I won't be. Keep reminding people about the free parking. That's an incentive. <laughs> Members, is there a motion to approve contracts and the contract amendments with McDermott, Will, and Emery? Norton. Rose Fulbright and Alan Boyd Consultants. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion approved. The chair recognizes CPRIT's communications director, Mark Lofler, to update us on CPRIT's communications activities. Mm -hmm. 
Alan Boyd. Was it Gabriel? Okay. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, you've got my memo. It is the last page in your packet, so it's easy to find. Um, really, uh, you'll see the media relations portion has picked up significantly. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, also, of course, as I've reported in the past, our social media numbers continue to at least head in the right direction. So they're still trending upwards, and that's always good with uh, with the uh, the work that we're putting into it. So uh, I also wanted to um, echo what uh, Wayne had said about welcoming Justin. Uh, he's going to dramatically increase our capabilities for CPRIT in terms of video, photography, uh, and as a matter of fact, on that note, we, we do uh, have, uh, we are going to interview our presenters today, so if y'all are welcome to attend, come watch those interviews. They're going to take place in E1020, just right around the corner, so after the meeting's over, we're going to be interviewing both of them, and then we'll use those clips on our website, on social media, and hopefully in the annual report which is coming up as well. Uh, I also wanted to point out that, uh, as you see in my report from the media relations previously, KXAN has been a great supporter. They're actually here to do more interviews today. So that's the third meeting in a row that they've come to cover CPRIT, and that's a pretty good record so far. So thank you to them for helping get the message out about the good work y'all are doing. So, And then the last reminder I had, and then I'll, and then I'll shut up, is uh, we are going to try to get a group picture today of the committee. So if possible, if y'all can hang around just a little bit, Justin will be taking that picture, uh, I think, right here in front of the dais, but I'm going to defer to him as a photographer and let him make that decision. But if y'all could hang around just a little bit so we can get that picture, I'd appreciate it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roberts. I'm going to beat this horse to death, but here again, I think you can see the strengthening of the staff. Uh, I'm very pleased with the development and the new the, the, the employees that have been brought on board, and I think it's paying off. I think it's visibly paying off. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I can just see you on TikTok. <laughs> no, you can't. Not uh, no, you won't. <laughs> Dr. Rosenfeld. Mark, I can't tell you uh, how much, uh, how, how great I think your daily newsletter is. I, oh, yeah, I look forward you. to reading it every day. Thank you. And just one question. Since our last meeting, what story has got the most press? Which story has gotten the most press? Yes. Uh, the grants, uh, the, the, in terms of what Seaport is doing? And, yes. Yes, the, the media following the grants, uh, has been a very positive story, and I think that's what it should be. That's what Seaport should be. We have nothing but positive stories to tell. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all that they're going to hear about Seaport are positive stories, and that's the way I want to keep it. So uh, I think that's what's gotten the most press for us in terms of getting the word out. Uh, a lot of people didn't know about Seaport in terms of the, at least a TV story, so it, it makes for a good TV story. And uh, the ability to work with our institutions, we've also got a lot of cooperation from our institutions to provide us video. And um, I'm actually going to be reaching out to them to see if I can find a, a scholar to interview because to focus on the recruitment grants. So it's what y'all are doing is, is the big news. Thank you. Thank you. So, Marco, I was just wondering how many, there's, there's a multitude of platforms out there. Uh, how many platforms are we on? We are only on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, not Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So we've not really considered adding any more platforms. Uh, but if, if Wayne wants to become an Instagram influencer, <laughs> I'm certainly happy to do that. <laughs> he could have a whole new career. Not going to happen. No, no, just. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. We will not take up selling agenda items 18, 19, or 20. Moving on to agenda item 21, we will meet again to regale ourselves 
<laughs> on February 15th, if there's no problems. If there's no further business and there's no objection, the chair moves to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favour? Aye. 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 Motion carries. This meeting stands adjourned at the ungodly time of 11.30 or 11.25. Surprise. Wow.